Ken Campbell. The Seekers Podcast. Walk about snell speed day long day long lies one half one belong everyone something bugger up dead finish yet time Welcome to Ken Campbell the Seekers Podcast, hosted by me, Daisy Campbell, Ken's daughter, and David Bramwell. So Daisy, why did your dad call this show Hyphenator? Ah, well, yeah, Charles Fort of Forty and Times fame, he used to say that a full stop is a lie or it's a hyphen coming straight at you. And uh, Dad took this very much to heart. He felt that uh, everything was probably linked to everything else if you looked hard enough. And so um, so this is, this is him as hyphenator, him as linker of this and that to this and that. And in this particular show, he uses the device of uh, the artwork of his parrot Doris to tell various tales from his life. And we'll leave it for the listener to discover how... Doris the Parrot actually created art. <laughs> there are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. And the Arctic trails of their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The Northern Lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was the night on the marge of Lakeley Barge. I cremated Sam McGee. Someone you like a lot, Stein? Probably the best thing you'd do for him is in sunsets to get him home. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold through the Parker's Fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If your eyes you'd close, then the lashes froze, so sometimes you couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, the dogs were fed and the stars all ahead were dancing heel and toe, he turns to me and cap says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess, and if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he says with a kind of moan, it's the cursed cold. It's got right hold till I'm chilled, clean through to the bone. Yet taint being dead, it's the awful dread of the icy grave. <laughs> the pains, I want you to swear that foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. <laughs> now, uh, 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 <laughs> I've got a thing I, I, I call the Dolly Parton hole. Now I'm getting on a bit. What happens is this. Every morning um, when I wake up, I can't remember the name Dolly Parton. <laughs> I can't think of her, but... <laughs> the problem is, I don't, I don't know what else is down the hole. <laughs> it seems to me the best thing is that I just take it easy, you know what I mean? Like, what's her name? I put it written up around the place here. Dolly Park, we're okay. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I was, I was um, out early in the morning trying to get money out of the hole on the wall. I sent a number and it said, no, it's not your number. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's not your number either. Now, I've, I've, I've heard that you only get three shots. <laughs> oh, was that fucking woman's name? I can't think. <laughs> so I went and had a cappuccino. <laughs> Dolly Parton! <laughs> oh, two, one, two, yeah! <laughs> oh, right. oh, there you are. A pal's last need, of course. A pal's last need is a thing to eat, so I swore I would not fail. We started on the street at dawn, but Christ, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh and he raved all day of his home in Tennessee. And by nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. 
There wasn't a breath in that ladder death as I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, but it seemed to say, you may tax your brawn and brains, but your promise true, and it's up to you to cremate these last remains. And then, verse upon verse, laughing around in the Arctic. <laughs> Phenomenal. See, um, yeah, um, our Latin master used to recite now uh, Robert W. Service. It's by Robert W. Service. He was like this, the Latin master, his name was George Harvey Webb. And he would come in and he would teach violent, torturing Latin for ten minutes. Uh, etc. But then you could get him off the subject. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was the worst doing because he, he knew everything about everything. George Harvey went it. Um, I mean he um, he'd been he'd been in Hitler's youth. <laughs> I mean, that's back a bit when it was kind of okay. <laughs> <laughs> he worked for British intelligence in the war, and uh, he was in MI5 as well. And also, he, he had known Alistair Crowley. Yeah, what a spin on the name, and I'm an arm, 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 and I'm an arm. He, um, one day, then, he, he wasn't there, he didn't come in, and he never came in again, and nobody said anything, and that was that. And, uh, and then eventually, he got a new chat, and he'd done. Um, he didn't really know much else about much else. I mean, to get him off the subject was kind of more boring than Latin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's known, he's known Robert Service, the author of um, The Shooting of Dan McGrew and The Cremation of Sam McGee. They spent a night together, apparently, in some Arctic shaman Eskimo's shed. <laughs> the door, the, the walls of which apparently were decorated with beaver and seal skin, spattered with <laughs> blood and filth and feathers, and that these artworks had talismanic powers. Now, what happened was this. It was a few years ago, my uh, daughter said, uh, I've got to get a computer, I've got to get um, Googling and all that stuff, and interneting and stuff, uh, otherwise I'm just going to get old. And I, I kind of had the money, so I set off to do that for her. Uh, but then I found, if you're prepared to pay just a little bit extra, you can buy a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a ter terrific little uh, Afri African grey. And I, I got it. And I said, so what are we going to call you? And it said, Doris. Yeah, yeah, I've taught it, it's sort of biography. Uh, you have to teach it in short little bursts, where you can do, uh, do its story so far, as I was. Um, I used to be an egg. <laughs> and I hatched out, didn't I? All fluffy at first, then my feathers. I was in a pet shop for a while, then Ken bought me. That's the as far as we got. <laughs> <laughs> and then she, um, she started producing artwork. Um, the first is I, gave, I gave her bits of paper, see? And she, I, I call these the pectures. <laughs> pecs them. Worth having a look in the interval, there's a, uh, a terrific Jesus there in his crown of, crown of thorns <laughs> up there, the pectures, and there's this, uh, there's some more pe pectures, a pecture plus filled up there. <laughs> Yeah, we had stuff like this. A warming sheriff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, darn it. Um, what um, I invited the great publicist, Mark Borkowski, round to see Doris's art. And he said, this is big. <laughs> he said, this is big. He said, well, he said, we'll have a gallery showing. He said, for Christ's sake, don't let anything go cheap. What kind of prices? He said, let nothing go under three grand. <laughs> okay. 
And then I've got loads of this. I just, I, she's got a whole room to herself now. No, I live in here. Well, I'll fake all around and she gets, gets on with it. So she's really producing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, oh, well, God. Anyway, I tell you what, he, um, I, the gallery is showing is to come. Uh, <clears throat> but he did get... He, 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 he did get this film work for me and Doris. It was extraordinary. Cobra Beer were to be promoting movies on some channel or other on the telly. And um, that, uh, to help promote their promotings, they were running a five second amateur film competition. <laughs> you had to send me a five second movie. And, uh, and thing. Anyway, so I think Mark Wolkowski was working, I think, on that turn. Uh, on that account, and um, so um, he sent around. Did you know about this? There are professional amateurs because <laughs> there isn't enough good amateur stuff coming into those kind of programs. Did you see? So you've got professional amateurs. Anyway, so there's some professional amateurs around. They're great guys um, to make to make ten five second movies of me and Doris the parrot and her art. You see. Anyway, they were, they were damn fine, these little films. But the understanding was I would be paid, curiously, the same amount as I paid for Doris. I would be paid that on the understanding that none of my films would win. Do you see? <laughs> Terrific. But then it turns out that the um, managing director, or whatever it is, of, of Cobra Beer, the top man of Cobra Beer, <laughs> is an Indian gentleman. And it's his... Um, dream that he's going to become the first Indian-born Prime Minister of Great Britain. And he said, he said, uh, uh, that art of Doris the Parrot is too controversial. <laughs> My prejudice is just of being Prime Minister. I suppose we were talking about, because I was showing some of her little work, for example, like this one, the, the bombing of Baghdad. <laughs> This one, this one, I showed up the five-second movies, the, uh, the Irish problem. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can clearly see, look, 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 uh, to see Look Back in Anger, the first performances, one of the first performances of Look Back in Anger, and was stunned by it, by, by the message of the piece. It turns out that if you're prepared to be sufficiently rude, but like incredibly rude, find women like Mary Yo who fall in love with you. <laughs> you've got to keep it going, you've got to keep it going. No, no, no. Keep, keep it going, and if they need to bugger off for a short sure while, they'll leave their best friend for you to fill in. <laughs> And, they, and even if they've um, <laughs> had miscarriages, they keep it up! Keep it up! Don't. <laughs> also, around right about the same time, I went to uh, the Theatre Royal Stratford East to see um, one of the first performances of Joan Littlewood's production of Brendan Bayer's The Hostage. <laughs> Christ, that was good. And at The Hostage, there was incredible violin playing, incredible fiddle playing, the wildest of fiddle music coming to the wings, and at the end of that night's performance, there was, a, there was a demand from the audience that we find out who had been playing this fantastic <coughs> old Irish film, it was beyond. And onto the stage came the Latin master, George Harvey Webb. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, I went round the back to the stage door to congratulate him on his performance. <laughs> anyway, it turned out that Mr. Webb was hosting that night a cast party at his place, and he invited me, and he was good enough to bring my dad up to say I'd be okay. Man, this was the party. I mean, these, these guys were putting away their drink. James Booth, he was there. And I don't know like that. Wow. And the only way to keep up with these fine people, I got as pissed as, as fast as I could uh, there. And then, inspired by Look Back in Anger, there was Anne Beach, the actress Anne Beach was there. And I was wonderfully rude to her. <laughs> and she socked me. <laughs> and as I came to, I thought, oh, wow, a show business life for me. <laughs> I'd like to call your attention to this little one. I'd like to do this one uh, before the interval.
uh, as it's one of the other ones that might get overlooked. It's a lovely little piece. You need to come and have a look at it close. I just showed a photo at the front here. Let's see. Um, well, what it is, it seems to me, is actually, it's this old photograph. Huh? But, but, yeah, but it's like it's gone on. It's like a few years later. That's, <laughs> that's long ago. That's, that's um, you know, the, the, parrot did, the parrot didn't do this. This is this. Is, this is. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's my daughter with a little dog called Werner. Yeah? Well, now, as you see, she's now got a daughter. My daughter's got a daughter who's twice that age now. So it's. It's long ago that, that but the parrot seems to have kind of done it. But here's Daisy now. Look, she's standing there, but it's like she's got a skirt over her jeans. And, and there's little Werner uh, jumping up. Can you see? Werner. Werner, an odd name, odd name for a dog. It came about from this guy, Outrageous Betrayal. The dog journey of Werner Earhart <coughs> from S to Exile. Back in the 70s, uh, he was well known, this guy, he's forgotten now. Werner Earhart. Man, what a terrific guy. He ran an outfit called Earhart Seminars Trainings. And it was um, how to be a more remarkable person, two weekends, two savagely long, violent, violent they were, weekends. How to be a more remarkable person, Earhart Seminars Training. You had to pay a hell of a lot of money out. I went and did it at the. Uh, uh, the, the hotel at Victoria, let's put Victoria Pants Hotel, and that's how it's on that. And I did it. Anyway, I thought it was brilliant. You know, it's some kind of a new, wonderful branch of show business. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, while I was watching it, I was inspired to think that I could run one of these and would rather like to. But I thought, what I'll call mine, I'll call mine Jess. Do you know what I mean? And I, I sort of conceived how I could take a, a, a lighter route to enlightenment. Yeah? And I, I, I produced, before the end of the two weekends, I produced, oh, here we are, a little leaflet. It was kind of like a takeoff of their own leaflet, the, the, the jest leaflet for. Um, what is the purpose of the jest training? The purpose of the jest training is to transform your ability to sense the ludicrous in everything. So that every situation you find yourself in seems to be the jape of the century. Ken Campbell, founder of Jest, said, sometimes people get the notion that the purpose of Jest is to make you a comedian. It's not. I have to think that you are hysterically funny the way you are. The problem is that people get stuck seeing how tragic they were instead of how comic they are. And I have to look this out at the, um, at the uh, Finale of the Esther and all like that. And I got time, um, around about 15 tables, who <laughs> were prepared to come out of my place and be experimenting. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, I, I, I'm going to cut to the bit where uh, I, I got them all. They all had paper bags on their heads for some purpose. They, they were sitting there with large carrier bags on their heads, paper ones. And then there was a ring at the doorbell. And there were these. Um, little kids, really little kids, and they saved a load of puppies from drowning. And um, they, they were knocking on doors to see if anyone wanted one. They saved them out the uh, Regent's Park Canal. Um, I said, well, there's quite a, quite a few people here. You can come and show your puppies to them if you like. Anyway, so I took these little lads and they brought these in. And there were 15 grown-ups all the <laughs> And they were little, they were kind of streetwise kids, you know how they're making it, you know, what they're doing. And um, anyway, they put their puppies in the middle of the sofa, and I said, OK, you can take your bags off now. <laughs> anyway, funny, did anyone want one? Did you know, nobody took one. Nobody ever. And I said to the kids, I said, well, which is the best one? He said, he said, we think that one there. I said, well, if you want, you can leave that one here if you want. And they, they did, they just left it. Left it with me and went uh, 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 on the way to knock on more doors. Anyway, there was a woman who did come to my chest thing called Tina Packer. I mean, there's a few of you might remember her. Tina Packer, she was kind of a theatrical woman. 
Uh, but she was ahead of me in the est business because she'd done her est before me over in San Francisco, where I'd have to wait till the guy can't dare see. Anyway, she came. Anyway, at the end of it, she said, that was a very, she had, she has funny arms. She said, that was a very um, irresponsible thing to do. I said, what was? She said, taking that puppy on. She said, she said your jest workshop was going very well. <laughs> she said, and then it brought the puppy in and she had all got sloppy. And I said, oh, all right. And then she said, in any case, you're not going to look after it. I just said, I said, gee, how do you know whether I'm going to look after the thing or not? <laughs> and she said, well, what are you going to call it? And I said, Werner. <laughs> Oh, she was shocked. <laughs> she said, you, you can't, it's a bitch. I said, well, I'm going. <laughs> so, just to annoy Tina Packer, I really looked after that dog. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what happened? I was, I was breeding ferrets at the time. And um, so I knew, and, uh, so I knew, I knew like, 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 the, the dog has got to be tough. Do you know what I mean? So I st stuck it out, uh, out, out the back uh, with, a, with a ferret. So they were in their cages. So out the back. But then one night, when he was making a hell of a racket, the puppy was, wow! And it was really loud. And I was worried that the neighbours were going to complain. Wow! So like, and then I said, no, 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 it's got a wow! It got loud. Wow! 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 It was going, wow! Wow! So I laughed about it. Anyway, when I went in there, two of the ferrets had got out. And there was a little puppy, and it had discovered that if it went, wow! 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 And opening and closing, it said, wow! 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 As long as he kept doing that, you wouldn't get eaten at that moment by a ferret. <laughs> Dim down the noise a bit, turn down the noise a bit. I, I put it um, in the bottom of my bed under all the sheets and everything. Like, boop, boop. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, it's like so I said, in the morning, in the morning, it, it was never able to raise one ear because that, that, that muscle that deals with uh, you can prick your, the, uh, it had been eaten by a ferret. <laughs> But after that, it was absolutely perfect. It didn't have to be trained or anything. It's all like that. <laughs> then, uh, when it had its Liverpool puppies, it had puppies in uh, Liverpool when I was doing the Illuminatus. And uh, it was. Uh, and it, it, had all, it had all kinds of puppies. Because um, there were many fathers. It had, been, it had had many fathers, and I think they banged up a bit. It had, uh, there was a brindle puppy, there were two Labradors, two golden Labradors. This is a little black and white dog, mongrel dog, this. And they had um, two, two Labradors, a whippet. <laughs> a dog with white socks. <laughs> and when, that, when the puppies got to be about um, I know, seven or eight weeks old, what she did were, like the mutt, was she lined them all up like this and raced in and attacked them. <laughs> <laughs> It was like what she was doing, saying, Yeah, well, what would you do if a ferret came at you? Ferrets come to kids like you and they're like, wah, 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 wah. And she would go on and on until these little bucks go, wah, wah, wah. wah. <laughs> <laughs> she was terrific. I mean, that was, that was a terrific dog. And it was a show business dog. <laughs> it was um, in my production of um, School for Clowns, I know to be. Also, it was in a, a Canadian movie, it was in the London bits of Joshua Then and Now Canadian movies, in the episode of Sherlock Holmes. It was also in the matinees of a kids' show at the Arts. Every day, it, it was a month's run, that thing. And it had to play, it was a real part, that was. It was, it was in seven scenes, playing a dog called Fritz. And um, it, was, it was set in uh, Nazi times, it was about kids escaping from Nazis. And it had to eat a meal on stage, and it had to uh, you know, act being in a boat. <laughs> but the, the greatest thing was, she went to work on her own. <laughs> what would happen is the uh, taxi would come, <laughs> and, and the taxi would take her off and her nun and do it. There was many scenes, and she'd stay for a biscuit and a bone with the fans, and then ta taxi home. <laughs> 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 when she was round, when she was round about fifteen, she started to dig a hole. 
This was no ordinary hole. This is the kind of hole that a badger might do, a fox might. This was tunneling she was into. All right? And then one afternoon she went down the hole and wouldn't come up. I mean, she could simply come up, uh, but she wouldn't come up. And it went on and it started to get laid. And it dawned on me what had probably happened here. This dog was perfect, perfect little animal. But it was so perfect, obviously, that it had dug its own grave and gone down to die quietly in it. And so I got a sleeping bag and I spent the night out there with my hand down the hole, like that. And a bit of life maybe, but cold, like that. And I came in that morning and uh, I said to my daughter, that's okay, you, uh, you're going to have to go to school today. Uh, let's, have, let's have another picture, another uh, uh, yeah, picture. Yeah, maybe the one that looks uh, cheerier. <laughs> right. What the heck? That was the green one. <laughs> the yellow and the green one. Oh, I will do that. The yellow and the green one. Yeah, this is, um, this is Doris's picture of two dogs uh, of um, more recent times. Kind of now times. That's Max and Gertie. Uh, that's Gertie. That's Gertie, Max's mother. Uh, they are, and and uh, there, there's um, her picture of Max. Here's a, proper, here's a proper photo of Max there with his cup. Yeah, I mean, some, some say it was the cup that, that done it for him. Others say it was Princess Anne. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, Gertie, she was a, she was a dog. My daughter, said, my daughter said I needed a dog that did things. I don't. I, I, I've got just an old dog at that time called Fred, and he really did little. He was probably. Uh, 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 well, 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 I tell you what, Fred had a great time because little Werner, I got him at the same time, time in Werner's last year, I acquired him, it was a, you know, the dog that was just roaming around, roaming around. And, and Werner had developed, um, developed this uh, thing where she um, uh, was on heat all the time, she never came off heat, but, 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 but without getting pregnant. God, man! <laughs> so, Fred was screwing her all around the place all the time. And everything, but then I heard, well, I don't know, but that was Fred. I had Fred, but he got old now and all that screwing around and wearing. I thought, hey, my day. I had a fact, that's me. And, um, um, so anyway, Daisy, my daughter said, I've got to get a dog that did things. It was kind of her fault all this. I needed a dog that did things now. And so I was looking through the, the um, ads in Loot for dogs maybe that did things. <laughs> and there was that out there of a gypsy, uh, I said, deliver a gypsy cross this. It's the cross of uh, a lurcher uh, with a sheepdog, a lurcher with a collie. I mean, I'm, uh, I rang out the blog about this. He said, that's right. He said, he said, no, the purpose of these dogs is like, race out, kill something and bring it back. <laughs> and, um, and, and uh, you know, and they, 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 so they do things. Yeah, they do things. And um, they, they weren't kept in a house. It was like a line of dogs that weren't kept in houses. Um, and, uh, and so when I got there, uh, they were in a lorry. And on the way, I thought, if one wants to come, I'll have it. If one wants me, it can come. And so when I opened the door of the lorry, whoa, I caught his dog up there. I said, whoa, you, you seem to want to come. I said, well, I'll take this one. Yeah, this one wants to come. And it's a bitch, and I, and I, and I, and I called him Gertie. I called her Gertie. I thought because I got her young, you know what I mean? Like, maybe I could uh, persuade her off racing out and killing stuff and bringing it back. But the neighbour was very alarmed. Not a big dog, she was alarmed. She said, That's a wild animal you've got there. You've got the way it walks. Look at the smell it. <laughs> and, um, anyway, its first um, prey seemed to be motorbikes. <laughs> Race out! Get the motorbike! <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, then um, uh, she got knocked up by a wandering Labrador. It was a Labrador, well, it was half a Labrador, it was half Labrador. And it was owned by somebody, but only used to call in once a week. This was, um, I was living in the valley beneath Stamford Hill on the Walthamstone Marshes. And, um, uh, yeah, anyway, she got knocked up, and she had, to, she had these, uh, these puppies, one of which was Max. Well, I managed to get rid of Max, it went, went off to Ireland with this geezer. And, but then he brought it back six months later. He came all the way from Tony to bring the thing back. He couldn't, he couldn't cope with it. So, <laughs> no, no, anyway, so... A fella up 
After I've got four, day, four doors from me, a fella called Davis, it's actually practically Sergeant Davis of the Met, as it happened. Anyway, Sergeant Davis of the Met and his family, they had a dog. And they told it was uh, a spaniel, actually, quite a nice animal, called Guinness. Anyway, Guinness, um, unlike my dogs, they have been to proper training school, you know, they're pretty good, they go to their mother, they're in control. But he really wasn't trained at all, and he used to dive, dive over everyone's fences. And he used to come dive over coming out and run around inside mine. I didn't really mind this, let me tell you, but I thought, I don't mind doing that. And so I raised my fences. Once I'd raised the fences, then Max and the David dog Guinness became enemies. <laughs> and every time David went for rah, 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 rah. fences. One time when I'm over on the rugby pitch just behind the house, uh, I'm over one side of it, suddenly Max dies off to go and attack Guinness the dog and put a hole in its ear. And then it was Good Friday about three years ago, and I was coming over the door with Max and Gertie, I came out of the rugby pitch, then into Springfield Park, and then I see there's Davis there, and this is uh, two, two uh, young boys, his young, his young sons. And uh, they, they were running loose the dogs. And uh, so I thought, better call them in now. <laughs> but I couldn't see Guinness. I said, to, I said to Davis, where's Guinness? He said, I've lost him. But that suddenly took Max's attention this and he looked round and there was Davis, no Guinness, but there was Davis and the two Davis boys and I swear the dog mutated. Hairs, his face changed, a hair went up on his back and he walked very differently, slowly, deliberately and ignored any call by me now and he went round the back of the two boys it was very unhinging, this whole business. <laughs> and then to... No, the, uh, the, the, the tape cut out here, Seekers, at a rather pivotal moment. But basically, Max bit the copper in the ankle and he decided to press charges. I've done under the, under the uh, Dangerous Dog Act. This is the latest Dangerous Dog Act, what's called the Pit Bull Act. And I got... Um, I managed to get a solicitor who only does dog trials. <laughs> and he said, um, he said, you probably don't realise the uh, people you're in here. He said, if things go wrong for you, he said, you could wind up spending two years in jail. I said, really? I said, listen, I said, back back. I don't think it bit him. I think his own dog probably bit him, <laughs> is, is, is what happened. And he's blaming me. He said, look, he said, if you like, he said, he said, we'll go in and challenge it like, uh, like that. He said, let me tell you that. He said, in courts, despite what you might think, policemen are believed. <laughs> <laughs> he said, your best route, said the solicitor, is to have your dog put down now. He said, then I might maybe able to get you off the whole thing, if you do that. I said, no, no, I wasn't going to do that. He said, listen to me. He said, only 4% of dogs survive this. 96% are going to get put down. I said, well, how do you get your dog to be one of those 4%? He said, well, I knew that. He said, I've been rich. He said, it, he said, it happens on a whim, occasionally. He said, if you want to go that route, he said, let me give you this advice. Do everything you can think of. Actually, he stressed it like this. Do everything that you can think of. He said, then when they take a doll off you, he said, at least you'll be able to say, well, I did everything that I could think of. And I started to like, this suddenly became inspiring. I mean, it, it, it seemed like, um, like the trial wouldn't be for six months or something. Do everything that you can think of. So I spent every day thinking of yet more things, what I could do, everything, what's the extent of all this, everything, everything I could do. Um, I got, I got a phone number and the address of a dog psychiatrist who cost a lot of money. And I thought, wow, well, obviously if you pay him all that money, what will happen? I'll take your dogs a lot. I don't have to go in here. I'll go, well, man, these are terrific dogs, you know. Yeah, I need to write a letter to that effect. And that will be that done. Anyway, I went to show him the dogs. He said, Christ, you've got dodgy dogs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's out at websites, so I didn't really go try to see him again. Uh, then I, then uh, I heard about Brentwood. Out of Brentwood, they got the Essex Dog Training Centre. 
And he also got, there's also there, the Essex Dog Display Team. This incredible shit on display team. Uh, they've got, which is uh, pretty much all rescue dogs in it. But even though they're all mongrels and everything and stuff, they get to perform on crafts. There you go. Anyway, we the Essex Dog Training Centre. Man, this is heavyweight stuff. It's not like a domestic training at all there. And they'll train their dog up for uh, any, whatever you want. Police dogs are a lot going there. Roy and Andy, they're the guys. Anyway, they've been running out for years. Anyway, I told them I told them my tale. Okay, they said, well, let's uh, assess your dogs for aggression. So they involved Andy, who's a big geezer anyway. Andy now talks up with all this panic like he's so he's like Michelin man. He, he's got gauntlets on and a visor. Right? I mean this little cop man. And these ones, they're little big dogs, these. You know, man, Max and Gertie now, man, what's going on? Well, anyway, Andy's got the, uh, has the ability to piss off dogs. <laughs> <laughs> he behaves a bit like, um, a bit, it's a bit in a spastic or so, most of spastic, actually. Like that. Whoa, man, that dog's wet! Four, and on camera, we got it! Gertie, the, the mother, delivers 17 would be lethal bites to the throat. <laughs> in comes Max, seven, <laughs> right there. <laughs> They said to me, yeah, they said, um, uh, what you've got here is a killing machine. <laughs> 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 they said, it's like the dogs have fallen themselves into a two, two dog. They <laughs> 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 said, but <clears throat> actually, said, in fact, with you, it's a pack of three, but unfortunately, you are not the leader. <laughs> so, yeah, I said, I, 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 I said, I said, listen, look, 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 I said, look, these animals do what I tell them absolutely, 90% of the time. They said, no, no. They don't know what you tell them any percent of the time. <laughs> what it happens is it's going through the mother, who's the pack leader. Yeah? And then she says, she, she likes your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> something in it, maybe the dogs will do it. <laughs> so you notice she always does it a bit, a bit later. A few seconds later, so show the other Max, who's a, who's a governor here. They said, said regarding Max, they said, maybe, maybe he'd have been, he'd have been all right if he hadn't have fallen into, fallen into bad company so young <laughs> by his mum. <laughs> They said, anyway, because Max was the one that was in trouble, I said, um, OK, you say they train, let's see you walk Max to heel, OK? Which I did, and he was terrific. Heel, right? I mean, absolutely lovely. Heel. And then I said, uh, and then they said, turn to sit. I said, sit. And he sat beautifully, and they went, ooh. I said, what's the matter? You know, I said, sit. What? So I sat. They said, look at his foot. And he sat with one foot, this one, like his right front paw was over that foot. And they said, so that's dog, for I'm ahead of you in the packing order. <laughs> so it's the mother, Max, then you. This <laughs> <laughs> and they said, look, they said, that now to like, get in here, when we say sit, he's got to sit with both his feet there, behind your toe, okay? And I was about to do it, and said, hold on. And they made me put these big, heavy gauntlets on to walk my little dog, which he does so well. I can't heal. Right? Sit! Back <laughs> up here, don't we? Wow! <laughs> Incredible. So then I, I had to sign up for their heavyweight aggression program. I mean, this is real stern stuff. You wouldn't believe the monstrous dogs some people have got. They always be muzzled up to a Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like you don't progress out of that until you can control your dogs absolutely amidst all this mayhem. And then we moved Max, because he was the one in trouble here, we moved him into agility. You know where they jump over stuff and through hoops and all that? that. We moved him in there, which he loved. And they've got very exotic agility there for the display team, like burning hoops and all that. Anyway, he loved it first game. He didn't have to be trained to do it. It was like I was put there for him. You absolutely want to do it, this stuff. Boom, boom, boom. And so my job was to... Be able to stop him at any moment. Right here, hold it! <laughs> you don't go through the burning hoop yet. Uh, that kind of thing. And um, 
he got awarded this cup for it. It's called the Barney, the Barney Cup. He won it for um, agility. Standing work, isn't it? Agility. It's, um, it's a big cup. I mean, it's one of those big cups that you that you have to give back. Oh, here's another thing I thought to do. I rang the solicitor. I said, how about if I move? How about if I sell my house and move? He said, that's a good one. <laughs> he said, that's a good one. He said, but you would actually have to have done it by the time we get to court. He said, it would be good, though. He said, you'd at least have to exchange contracts. You don't even go to court saying you've got plans and moving. You've got to do it. Um, he said, then we can say, it's only ever liked to buy Davis of the man, and now you know, you've moved. Yeah, terrific. So it's not easy selling a house quick. Uh, but I managed to find some man who I don't think ever saw it. But anyway, he ran up and agreed to buy it and thing. They went through the, the solicitor. And the exchange of contracts was due for the very morning of the trial, the dog trial in the afternoon. But there'd been a little hiccup when um, a cynic lady called Hannah, she was oh, like, no, 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 she was from Mossad, I think. Anyway, she thought she might like it for her daughter. Uh, the place. And offered another ten grand. And I've told ran up the original geezer. I said, I've been offered another ten grand. I'm gonna take it. He said, I'll match it. I'll oh, find so it went to here. So I'm waiting for his first call in the morning and Moss and Hannah comes round again, offering me another ten thousand pounds. Well I said, yeah, okay, yeah. If you've got it now, if you've got to pay that money, deposit money, I suppose it must have been. Have you got to pay that right now? Yes, it's yours. She said, that'd be so ridiculous. She said, tomorrow, Thursday, actually. Couldn't possibly be done. I said, well, no, no case that. Out you go. Because the thing was, I wasn't selling a house <coughs> for any other reason. But to save, save Max, if I could, it was for him. Because I had this notion that if I could enter the court, it would be like, I had this feeling of being kind of like Joan of Arc or something. Do you know what I mean? If I could enter the court completely pure, the man who had done everything he could me. You don't get to take your dog on incidentally, but you can, if you have one, take their car. And so... <laughs> get my car. But, um, anyway, the solicitor said, he said we were appearing before a lady judge. He said, it's not one that I've appeared in front of before. He said, they tell me she's uh, straight down the line. He said, I don't know how it'll go. Okay, so we didn't there. Anyway, first thing she said, she's looking at the car. She said, what's that? And the solicitor, uh, took control now. He said, it's the Barney Cup, ma'am. He said, uh, Max the dog is a very distinguished animal in the realm of canine agility. <laughs> she said, well, why did this uh, remarkable dog bite this particular man? And he said, far be it from me, ma'am, to claim I know the reasoning of dogs. <laughs> he said, but experts have suggested at the time of the unfortunate encounter, Max the dog made the assumption that Mr. Davis was Mr. Campbell's enemy. She said, well, why would it have done that? Was Mr. Davis acting in a menacing manner? He said, he's a policeman, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, he said were you to find yourself able to grant Max the dog his life, he said, he would be performing in two weeks' time at Earl's Court. He's been offered a place in the Essex Dog Display Team. And this was true. Royer said, if he gets through that trial, he said, if he gets off, he can appear at our school, the Essex Dog Display Team, he said. I mean, his notion was that, that at best, I, uh, I would get uh, leave to appeal. And it would have been really good. He produced a little film out of about <coughs> good Max was ready, ready for the appeal. But she said, I could miss him his life she said. And she um, gave me a £50 fine, and then for Davis, we'd seen that uh, um, he, he got 50 quid. I, listen, I'd been into him, I said, I'd offered him a thousand to drop all this. Anyway, he got 50 She said, she said Show me the photo of, uh, of the dog. Can I see a photo of the dog? She said, oh, I know these dogs, she said. These are the kind of dogs they use for, for rounding up cattle. She said, he, he said, he was probably just trying to move him along. <laughs> <laughs> The solicitor just holding me for a moment. He said, don't, he said, don't pay just for a moment. He said, I want you to just boggle with me, he said. 
because I've never seen a trial go like that. <laughs> I mean, the thing was, I knew why it was, because I was the man who had done everything, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Martin, it was really being clear. Anyway, I, uh, I made the money. Oh, well, I know it was cool, it was terrific. I had to go along with the wee, wee trainer, and he did a special event. Max the dog and um, Roy over the loudspeaker. You can't really hear what they're saying. But anyway, he gave us the story of Max and how they, you know, like they did their great work at the Essex Dog Training Centre. They got it. And then when we got, we got the, um, the 15, 15 dog trainers, dog owners there. They all had to, they all had to roll their pick like that and make a whole, a whole tunnel of legs. <laughs> and, and Max the dog had to run from one <laughs> without biting it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was great, uh, Max, uh, uh, getting off like that and everything. And uh, I, I hadn't decided, you see, I hadn't decided where I'd be moving because I never wanted to move. <coughs> I'd be putting Max down, I wasn't really at all sure where I wanted to go. Anyway, I took the dogs around and I said, Where do you want to be now? And they chose Epping Forest. So that was easy. I just went round and round Epping Forest many times and I found a little wooden house, a little wooden, wooden chalet house. And uh, right in the forest there. And uh, well, anyway, we moved in there. And Doris, I had Doris the Parrot. Doris the Parrot, she got a whole little room to herself, her own studio. Plus, he's Robinson apparatus, so she can follow the whole activity of the house. You know, without, uh, you know um, uh, flying away. So that was good. I was going to whip through some of these quick. Uh, this, this, this is the hat. Okay, that's a hat. What, what happened was when uh, Mark Borkowski uh, wanted to, you know, to do these gallery shows he was talking about, I thought it'd be rather good if I got my, my suit made appropriate for the occasion. So I, I, I sat the suit um, in, in with Doris and she decorated and I thought I'd do my hat as well. And um, I said, but then she did it. it it became such a work of art, I couldn't, I couldn't bear to think it, so there it is, it's, it's the hat. I mean, it's, it's quite a bit, a bit above the three grand mark. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you. Yeah, um, hyphenator, Hank Hamill, hyphenator, sounds good, doesn't it? But it, um, it turns out he's actually um, a medical condition, um, and then it's called Apophenia, apophenia, apophenix are people who find uh, links and connections between them where there are none. These are called apophenics. And um, when I look around all the crap at my place that I've accumulated, an enormous amount of my purchases are apophenic in nature. For example, there's a me recent one, um, Floss, it's a little little book for kids, it's slightly too young for my granddaughter, and you see it, Floss, it's got uh, a dog there leading over a gate, and also you get a free walker bear when you buy this book, it all came together, I thought, well, I'd better have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, was at, I was at my... Um, I was at my dentist. They're very nice she is, my dentist, I have to say. But she, she said to me, you don't floss, do you? I said, no. She said, why not? I said, well, because I come from a generation who, who don't floss. We don't floss. I love flossing up a car. I mean, you know, getting up early, you know. And I, you know. <laughs> she, said, well, she said, I'll tell you what we do for you. She said, we do, we do these. <laughs> Um, and you can see that, it's just like a little Y-shaped, uh, like a, a little plastic catapult actually. <laughs> a little bit of floss there, you see, just get it out and then you go... Uh, 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 now where are we just right on the, on the forest? <laughs> what, what happens is people who walk their dogs right, right by me, they don't, they don't stop themselves with plastic bags to, you know, pick up, pick up the dude. They don't. They, they don't. Okay, so I, I suppose it's in their heads, is what happens. Like, oh, oh, they, 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 they say, right, the dogs will shit in the forest, everything will be fine. But they don't, half the dogs don't shit in the forest, where they shit is right outside my house. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, what happens is you, um, 
Yeah, you know, you wind up, you wind up with a little, you know, bright-shaped plastic thing, you know, uh, whack, whack, you know, you know. And I suddenly had this, this thought, it was like it came to me, how I could really do something. I was a wee bit inspired by that lad, I think it was in Manchester, who, who painted luminous paint on um, chewing gum in the road and all that. You know, to alert and shock the people in, 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 in doing it. Anyway, <laughs> if you stick one of these into, into a turf like that, it kind of looks like a snake. <laughs> <laughs>
got a light, light around the house. I don't, I don't know. I don't go to the test. <laughs> Like that. Well, we better move on. Oh, yeah, let's, 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 let's do this one. That's a nice one. Here, you, here you're going to see. I mean, you have to kind of look at it in a certain way, and then it'll come to you uh, what that is. This one here. It's Michael Fagan lurking behind the Queen's bed, preparatory <laughs> to sitting on it. Um, <laughs> There's the Queen in her nighty in the bed, lying on her back there, and her cut on it. And there's, uh, there's Michael Fagan. Uh, when uh, it was all in the papers, this guy Michael Fagan had sat on the Queen's bed, in an instant he became my hero. I went out and I bought every newspaper, every day I was like every newspaper, and there was more and more about this extraordinary visit of this guy. Breaking into Buckingham Palace, finding the Queen's bedroom, going into the Queen's bedroom, meeting up with a Queen there. And then uh, having a little chat together, and then she's saying something like, no, I'm thinking I can get you, Michael. He's out to do it, a cigarette. She said, what do you smoke? He said, senior service. So she rings down to security, says, and they say, yes. She said, Queen here, could you send me a packet of senior service, please? And then down in the security, they said, oh, that was a Queen. She wants a packet of senior service. I was like, oh, I don't worry about it. And so they carried on, apparently, chatting together. And then, uh, and then it was time for him to go, and he was, uh, he was escorted. Oh, man, man, what a hero. And then we read in the paper, that wasn't his first visit. He had been on other occasions there. Not much about that. How interesting, John. And then I was alerted to the fact he was coming up to his trial at the Old Bailey, and I went there really early. I was about number nine in the queue there to go and watch the trial of Michael Fagan. Man, was it terrific. It was packed in there. And uh, I was sitting three rows behind Michael Fagan's mum. Right? Anyway, Michael came in. There's, a, there's a, um, a line in Robert's services, the shooting of Dan McGrew, when the guy comes into the bar. And he says this to the poet. He says, his eyes went rubbering round the room. And I, I've always thought that's a great line, but I've never quite known what it meant. His eyes went rubbering round the room. <laughs> And I saw the entrance of Michael Fagan, and his eyes went rubbering round the room. <laughs> and he has this ability, Michael Fagan, don't remember him. It's like, like when his face lights on yours. He does it, it an instant satiric mirroring of what you look like. Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man! It was a really entrance in life. Anyway, he sits there, and there's kind of forensic stuff going on, you know, photographs and things. And, and Michael said, you know, he was getting bored. And so he smiled up at his mum in the public gallery. Uh, then, uh, then he took his teeth out, <laughs> took his front, his front teeth out, and cleaned them uh, with, a, um, with a paper clip. And so I looked at his mother again, like that, and she went, "Oh, Michael!" <laughs> <laughs> and then we were on the job of the trial, and it turned out he wasn't being done at all for breaking into Buckingham Palace. Uh, uh, that wasn't a crime at all. It turns out. It's just, it was merely a, um, a case of trespass. I mean, he hadn't gone there, he hadn't gone there to make anything. Um, and so that was it, just, it was just trespass, common trespass. And, 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 and on those other occasions we did it, just nipped it, gone in. She, you know, she nuts and drain pipes, got up to the level where the windows are pop, pop, hopped into an, an open one. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then on this occasion, um, we did a queen. Uh, you know, when I asked to go, we got it. And so that was it. So that wasn't the crime we were there to do, because there hadn't been one. We were there because on this occasion he had stolen something in this wise. What he'd done is he'd helped himself to half a bottle of wine. Yeah? And he admitted, yes, that is a fact, he had done that. Yeah. I mean, what it was, was he was a bit thirsty, it'd be more difficult, he had to go to a higher window on this occasion, and, it, and he really needed a drink. Had there been a tap handy, he would have been very happy, happy with water, but there was no tap around where he was in Buckingham Palace there. But then he found himself in, in the presence rooms, this Princess Diana's presence, I don't know, I don't have a compliment, but anyway, there were presents there. And so, um, there was a bottle, a bottle of wine, there was a screw, screw top, uh, uh, yeah, it says cheap wine, then like Cyprus or something, so, <laughs> so, so um, he, he drank that and, um, and got on, so what he was being done for was stealing that half bottle of wine from Princess Diana, it was hers, but he claimed he was not guilty. Now the judge explained to us this, that if he's not guilty, then it must be 
that at the time of drinking the wine, he did not realise that the act of drinking it would deprive the rightful owner of it. <laughs> well, it's terrific in the dock. When, 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 he, when he came up into the witness box, Michael Fagan, he was being very peculiar. He put on a strange act. He yeah. wouldn't like that a lot. It was an odd oh, no, thing. <laughs> anyway, it turned out that the whole thing had been because he loved her. He loved her majesty, but in a pure way. He had, he had pledged his allegiance to her. And he was appalled loving her so much, her majesty. Uh, the way, you know, the way she's not looked after properly, you know. Uh, you know, I think it's leaving it so that any arsehole, like, for example, himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. And I sit on a bed, and I bang her. Anyway, that was the thing. Mm. Anyway, we get to it. It didn't last all that long. And then the judge said to the jury, he said, look, he said, I don't think it's going to take 12 um, intelligent ladies and gentlemen <coughs> very long to come to the opinion that Michael Fagan must have realised that the act of drinking the wine, the act of drinking it, must be depriving the rightful owner of it. Out you go, he said. They were out for 10, 15 minutes and they came back and they said, not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> Sometimes to me, it looks like uh, George Harvey Webb, I must say, George Harvey Webb, the, the Latin master, but it, it, it isn't. What it is, that's, um, there's a picture Doris has done there. Next to Jesus, I haven't looked at the Jesus. She does, she does those, uh, she does those pictures very fast. You know, things like that, that takes a few weeks. And, um, it's Mr. Chins. Mr. Chins, now, when Gertie, remember Gertie, Max's mother, there she is, when she had her puppies, there was one which was enormous. They were all kind of regular little puppies, and there was one bigger. They were all little black dogs, and, and not black puppies, but they were it and it had a little white mark there, and I called that guy Mr. Chins. And I kind of always wanted to have one day a big dog. And so Gertie delivered it. It was most peculiar. And it, was, it grew bigger, it grew bigger and bigger, Mr. Chins. And I, I kept Mr. Chins and uh, he was always with me. And then Max was brought back. And then it turned out that poor old Mr. Chins was epileptic. And it really it does your head in. Owning an epileptic dog. I mean, you have to join the self, you know, the um, association of epileptic dog owners. Because nobody knows quite what to do in this deranged. The dogs get to have visions of things. <laughs> and, um, I remember it was, uh, yeah, Mr. Chance, it was the, uh, it was around at the time I was in art. Do you remember that play with art? It was around three geezers, and one geezer buys a, a, a white painting. It's about three friends, they kind of fall out and come together weirdly over this white, all white painting the geezers bought. Anyway, um, they, 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 they were changing the cast on this thing every three months. And they got John Fortune to agree to be in it, and Warren Mitchell. And they asked Warren Mitchell who he wanted for the third person. And Warren said, me. He said, I want Ken Campbell. And they said, oh, Christ. And, 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 and anyway, they were the and I said, OK. And then they actually offered me the part. And I went to see it, and I read the script. I thought, oh, Jesus. I don't know if I could do it, you see. Because I, I can't really learn lines that well these days. This, this guy's got a three and a half page speech, which is traditionally delivered at breakneck speed. I thought, oh, God. And then he's got to spend ten pages crying, weeping there. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I thought about the weeping bit, and I thought, well, it's time to do it. I've always avoided that kind of thing, but it's time to do it, do you know what I mean? And I was working on techniques and studying the light and, um, you know, you know, sad things, and making sure kind of seeing what the face is that you're doing. And ten pages, like, oh, gee. Like that. Anyway, I thought, yeah, that's all right, but the whole thing is this long speech. Could I learn it? Anyway, I held off saying yes to accepting this job. Until I'd learned it. I learned a speech said, yeah, anyway, so I was in it. But then uh, the um, rehearsals of it, I, you know, I was showing, I didn't know when we got to the ten pages, I was showing, weeping, I was showing, you know, I do it like this. And, and, and the way it's staged is, I'd be sitting there, and the other two guys are down there talking to each other, you see, while I 
weep for ten pages. I know. And they said, no, 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 no. It's always done like this. It's the guy who cries like that for ten pages. I thought, oh, shut up. Really? They said, yeah. I thought, well, they'd put me up. Anyway, and I'll show what I could do, you know. And Warren Mitchell said, look, we can't act with you doing that. <laughs> So I, I, I didn't um, fuss about that. I used to find a way the thing got going, and I uh, enjoyed it. But um, as I used to come up the, the escalators at Leicester Square, they have a picture, they used to have a picture of the three people who were in art at the moment, and there was John Fortune, and there was my children, and then there was, then it was me as I went up. And um, over the days when they, when they went up, um, Warren Mitchell was getting lots of chewing gum. <laughs> <laughs> he got, he got lots. John Fortune had got, you know, a good number, and I've really got none. <laughs> and I was like, I thought, well, John Stubborn started chewing and had a few of that, and had a few of mine. And then Warren Mitchell had seen this, so I've seen uh, uh, David Hare. David Hare had been to Palestine, and David Hare was doing a similar evening to the kind I do, like these kind of evenings. He was doing one about his trip to Palestine. And what I mean to got, got um, a video of it, he was very keen that I saw it anyway, but and he kept asking me, have you seen it? I said, no, no, no. Anyway, it was Saturday morning, I thought, well, I better watch the thing now, so today I shall say yes. And I, 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 I put it on, and I, and I was uh, watching it. And, and uh, then uh, Max came in from the garden, Max the dog, and it was like he wanted me to go out. And I said, no, I've got to watch this David Hare thing. And I was watching him, watching him, Max was in. I said, go on, and he's off. And I was watching, uh, watching David Hare. And then, and then I went out in the garden. And what had happened out there was that uh, uh, Mr. Chins um, must have had a fit. He'd had an epileptic fit and, and, and had drowned in a little shallow pond. He drowned. Oh, God, I got my mate um, Sean round. It's wonderful, Sean. It's after the dogs when I'm doing things like this. And Sean came. And, uh, and, and we dug this. It was a bit of digger deep. We had a pit to get this big animal into. I, I, uh, and um, I went off to, uh, to do the matinee. <laughs> and at the matinee of art, what I did when we got to the ten pages, I went, I saw it. And I just sat there like that. And I thought about Mr. Chins, and I, I, I started to design, when I was sitting there, uh, a memorial service to it, in which, I, in which I'd wear a wolf headdress and everything, and give readings from a call of the wild, <coughs> stuff like that. And as I thought about that, I just sat there, not doing anything remarkable, except I could feel the tears plunging and the dampening of the fine suit they bought as well, I think, in art. Yeah. And um, at the end of the two shows, Warren Mitchell said nothing. And John Fortune came up and said, it was a privilege to be on stage with you tonight. I said, thank you. Anyway. <laughs> I applied a chewing gum tear to my pit. <laughs> <laughs> then it came a time when I got a phone call from someone calling herself Boo. I said, Boo? She said, yeah, Boo Webb. I am Boo. Yeah, of course. As, as George Harvey went to Lady Monster's daughter. Boo. Ah! Because I had this thing that I was going to do was to ring up everybody um, in my address book. There's a name I couldn't think of who they were. Ring them up and say, who are you? And I'd come to this bit in my address book where it said 1300. I said, who's that? Who's 1300? Of course, it's Boo. And um, anyway. <laughs> bringing me up to tell me that um, her father was going to be dying that week. And that if I wanted to see him at all, I ought to get uh, speedily over to the Hampstead Hospice. Anyway, so I, I, I went. And um, he, was, he was in bed, George. He actually looked, looked very smiley, I thought. He still knew quite a lot about quite a lot. And I said goodbye. But then, uh, when I went there um, later in the week, uh, Boo said, well, he's, he's uh, lapsed into a coma now. 
she said. Uh, she said, look, they do think that he may well hear what you're saying, but he's in a camera, it's not thought he would come out of it. But she said, if you'd like to, you could, um, uh, you know, go in and talk to him. So I decided, I, I tried to look like that's just absolutely what I'd love to be doing. And yeah. And I went in. And it's, um, that's quite a weird business, this. I go, man. Till we came to the marge of Lake Libarge, and a derelict ship there lay. It was caught in the ice, and I saw it a trice. It was called the Alice May. And I looked at it, and I thought a bit, and I looked at my frozen chart. Then here, said I with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. Some planks I tore from the cabin floor and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, the furnace roared, such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal and I stuffed in Sam McGee. And I made a hike for I didn't like to hear him sizzle. <laughs> and the heavens scowled, the huskies howled and the wind began to blow. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear. But the stars came out, and they danced about, and again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peek inside. I guess he's cooked. It's time I looked. <laughs> then the door I opened wide, and Sam sat up, looking cool and calm in the heart of a furnace roar. He wore a smile, you could see a mile, and he said, shut a fucking door! <laughs> She said, look, do you, want, do you want us to uh, sort it out, or what do you want to do here? And I said, no, no, no I'm going to be taking her with me, you know, and I her in the car. And I got, I got a blanket with me. So I wrapped the little body up in a blanket. And then when I stepped out, there was a monsoon raging. You know, like there was the other day, but suddenly there were the roads and rivers. It was like that out there. And in, in uh, back in those days, I had, I used to love it, a little blue Morris pickup is what I had, you know, like a little truck. And I used to keep it in an ultimate crappy condition with all the news, you know, like that, just crappy. And I like that, and it seemed to suit it, and suited me, certainly. Anyway, but then when I got in the monsoon and everything to the, to the Morris, I couldn't, I couldn't work out how to get my keys out of my pocket and open up, open up the truck. And, because uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to put the body down in the, uh, in the flying water. And there was a, a cynical, rabbinical gentleman there. And you are allowed to talk to them in times of emergency. 
So I went, went up to and, and like what they do, what they do is rain the Hasidics. You know, so they have to wear hats. They have to wear a little hat and then a hat over the hat. And it's raining, they put a hat over the hat. And he had his little, you know, it's all over hats on. And um, I said, I said, uh, I said, sir, I said, you, you, you want me kind enough, would you, to to get this is quite a bit, you, to get my car keys out of my pants pocket there? And he said, certainly. And he put, his, he put his rabbinical hand in my pocket and took out the keys. And I said, could you open the door of the... He said, certainly. And he opened it. And I laid the little body down on all this uh, crap newspaper and stuff. And he said, your child, is it? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> in Stamford Hill, I discovered living not far from me, Michael Fagan. Oh man, what a guy he is. He's just terrific. I think in one sense he is the funniest person in the world. I mean, what a queen should have done. I mean, Charles, she just missed such an opportunity, it seemed to me. She should have declared him the court jester immediately. Mm, it's not actually what he says, but you know that he's thinking of a million absurd and funny things. Maybe give me one. And, um, it turned out, look, I'm going to put it this way. I mean, I just kind of got into it. Listen, he had been a serial visitor to Buckingham Palace. He was in and out of the palace, Michael Fagan. And it went like this. Do you remember this bit? This was in the papers. It was uh, that night, that night, the one, the one that he was in court for. Uh, he'd been prior to um, his visit to the palace. He'd borrowed a fiver of his sister. And she'd said... I hope this isn't for drugs, Michael. And he'd taken the fiver and turned it over so that just the Queen's head was showing. And he said, there's where it's at now, babe. You see, this is what happens. Um, read up on this. What happens is that people with, people with addictive personalities, I mean, they're, like, they're going to have to be addicted to something. But what terrific, wonderfully, Michael had managed to do. He got himself off drugs by Buckingham Palace. <laughs> <laughs> he was finding that he was getting um, a, a similar charge and a drowning rush by going into Buckingham Palace. <laughs> yeah? But, um, and and you, you, you know, like sometimes marijuana smokers do this. You know, they get, they get appalled by the amount of marijuana they're smoking. So what they do is they buy an enormous amount of it, an old bin bag of hats and stuff like that, in order to have a great orgy, a large kind of orgy. They're just going to disgust themselves with themselves, and then boom, that'll be it. <laughs> and that's why Michael now was trying to get himself off Buckingham Palace. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he was on the hunt now for the Queen's bedroom. Like once he made it into the Queen's bedroom, boom like that, and made a noise in there and something like that, and like, that'd be it, and he'd be um, on to the next thing. <laughs> it's very difficult. I think he's been lent on a lot not to talk about uh, his time with the Queen. So even if you get close to him, it's like very little you get. That's a good And he said, anyway, so it, so it seems it was probably the like of this. That, I mean, he pretty much worked out which must be the Queen's bedroom. And here we go. And he's going in. And the first shock is this. this I mean, he's expected to see, see the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen in, the bed, in, a, in a bed. There's only one person in the bed. And it looks to be far too small for the Queen. So he creeps on <coughs> to the window. We're in the early morning hours now, and he pulls the curtain a little bit to let a little shaft of the morning light come on the bed. And then he said to me, you've seen The Exorcist? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, well, it's way worse than uh, <laughs> when that kid spits blood. He said, so he, yeah, he sleeps out of the bed. Where, where, where? And he was like, yeah, like that. I said, wow, man. And he was out there. Where? 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 He was going. Well, I said, what, 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 what's she kind of opening and closing? Like <laughs> <laughs> I said, what's she back to like? Where? <laughs> so I said to him, oh, I said, I said uh, and that's the noise that allergic people are uh, He got sorted. I said, oh. I said, so, so you, you didn't sit on the Queen's bed then? 
He said, would you sit on the Queen's bed if you'd just shit yourself? <laughs> that led the Rosers to me with their allegations. These flossers are rare, and in our air, yeah, only sold by one dentist to patients. The nursery school had run on that some fool had given their parents the shakes by painting dog shit with such art and wit that the parents had thought they were snakes. That's not funny, is it? <laughs> The nursery school had rung that some fool had given their parents the shakes by painting dog shit with such art and wit that the kiddies had thought they were cakes. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. That's all. Ken Campbell, The Seekers Podcast, was produced and presented by Daisy Campbell and David Bramwell, with kind permission from the Ken Campbell Estate. Music was by Horton Jupiter. It was funded by Arts Council England. The disembodied voice of Ken was Jeremy Stockwell. <laughs> <laughs>